that I'm, we don't know how it is accurately pronounced, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, kia ora. Uh, good morning. My name is Te Herekeke Herwini. I'm the manager of the repatriation program in the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tongarewa, or we're just commonly known as Te Papa. Thank you. And the second uh, presenter is um, June John from the University of Birmingham in the UK. A straightforward um, name. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we have a PowerPoint presentation that's accompanying um, the Skype. So my colleague, Shao Kamina, is going to be operating the PowerPoint whilst um, Te and, um, and, and June uh, present. We have a, because it's a dual presentation, we have a slightly longer time period here. Um, and then we will have the stand to 10 minutes for um, comments, observations, and questions from the floor. Thank you. Let's go. Okay. Um, so once again, I'm Tehiri Keke. Um, you may have heard in the, um, the news over the last two weeks that there's been a major earthquake in Wellington. So if you see some shaking in the background, it will only be one of our major earthquakes. <laughs> so don't be alarmed. Um, I'm sure we'll be safe and sound for the next 25 minutes. Um, so our, 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 our presentation will be around the repatriation process of Māori and Moriori ancestral remains. Um, it's the major task of the program I'm the manager for, um, the Karangao Tero Repatriation Program. And so what we'll do, Dr. June Jones and, and myself, um, could we have slide number two, please? Um, so it indicates what we'll be talking about. One is the importance of repatriation, bringing our ancestors home. Number two, we'll cover the history of the trade and the collection of Māori and Moriori ancestral remains. In part three, why Māori are seeking um, our ancestors' home, repatriation, why it's so important. Number four, the intentions, sorry to, the intentions sorry associated to, with the sorry repatriation to of ancestral remains. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, T, but um, we have to recognise that for many people in the room here, English is maybe their second, third or fourth language even, so if you could maybe slow down a little bit, that I'm would be sorry. great. Thank I'm you. sorry, we talk quite fast in New Zealand. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry okay. to interrupt. So um, I'll go back to number one, the importance of repatriation. Um, number two, the history of the trade and collection of Māori and Moriori ancestral remains. N number three, we'll look at why it's so important for our ancestors to come home, back to their homeland. Number four, the tensions associated with the repatriation of ancestral remains. So that's tensions that institutions have overseas with allowing our ancestors to come home. Um, number five, the rituals associated with bringing our ancestors home and why that is part, an important part of the whole repatriation process. And also, number six, the process of building a bridge to repatriation. So between institutions overseas and us as the, um, the Museum of New Zealand, how we can work in partnership and collaborate, collaboratively with each other. So number three, can I have um, slide number three, please? And so in Māori, we say, tukuna mai he kapunga, oni oni he tangi. Sorry to interrupt your question about the presentation. Is, is the, the presentation is green? We have 22 slides, right? Yes. So you said number two, number right at, you re, re, Yeah, num number three, it should be at the, um, the right hand side at the bottom is the is the numbering. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, we're in place now, Tay. We're now in place, so we're okay. We're on slide yeah. three. Okay. Okay, slide number three, and so you should, you should have a hand with a holding soil and the plant. Okay, so uh, in, my, in the English version of that traditional saying is, provide me with a handful of soil from my homeland so I may feel the warmth of my ancestors in we. And so that's one of our traditional sayings. And why that's so important for us is that we believe we come from the land that we were raised in. This is our ancestral land. So our ancestors belong to this country. And so that's why um, the spirit of our ancestors and also the physical remains of our ancestors need to come home. Um, slide number four, please. And it's titled, The Outside World Arrives. And so Māori people, we've been in our country, um, we're East Polynesian people. Our people migrated from the Cook Islands 
and also French Polynesia about a thousand years ago. Uh, we, made, we made New Zealand our country. We were the first people here. So um, when the Euro Europeans arrived, the first contact we had with the Europeans was in 1645, and that was Abel Tasman. Um, he did not actually land in the country. He sighted the country, but he did not land in it. The first actual European to arrive and land is um, Captain Cook and, the, and his um, um, crew aboard. And so this is the time when the first trade and exchange of human remains began. Um, Europeans started coming to the South Pacific and they wanted to take curiosities of each Pacific nation that they entered into or landed at back to, back to Europe. And so one of the unique things that our people, um, one of our traditions is that we mummified um, our heads. So normally when we had a loved one that passed away, either a chief, male or female, their head would be mummified and that head would be revered um, in the future. So that head would be um, kept in a wahi tapu, a sacred place, and that may be a, ca a cave on a mountain or in a, in a hill. And from time to time, that particular mummified head would be brought out to the community and the, the deeds and the work, um, the her heroic actions of that particular ancestor would be remembered. Um, however, we also had another purpose of mummifying um, heads. If you were in battle and you defeated an enemy chief or an enemy warrior, you would mummify their head and you would um, do the opposite of revering them. You would um, neglect them, you would despise them, and also when Europeans arrived, you would trade their heads off to another country. And the particular reason why you would trade their head is that you would sever their link with our country spiritually. So their spirit um, would, would go, over, go over overseas with, with the head and never to return to this particular country. Um, so that was the exchange um, of mummified heads right from the beginning, 1769. And I've also put a picture of um, Daniel Solander, who was Swedish. He was aboard the first ship, um, Captain Cook's first ship, and he was also a trader and collector of human remains. And I think a number of uh, Māori human remains that were in Swedish museums are associated with that particular person. Next slide, please. Um, number five, the importance of ceremony in the Māori world. Um, the importance of ceremony is, is one, of, um, one, one of the most critical aspects of our, our culture that remains today. Um, the ritual of the funerary process or acknowledging those that have passed away is very important to us. It's like when someone is born, they have a birthday, they get married, they have children, our expectation that we all would have a funeral that would be part of the community that we belong to. And so it would not be um, restricted to a family, it would be the whole community that you belong to, it would be your family, your extended family, um, your workmates, your work colleagues, your social friends. They would be, it wouldn't be an invitation, people would just know to come. And so everyone would farewell that person over a three-day period. And there's, there's some particular things that we prefer that ceremony to have the char characteristics of. One of them is that we would prefer it to be on our marae, our community centre, our Māori community centre. We would prefer it to be public. And so all the community are welcome to participate. We would prefer our own language to be used. So the Māori language will be used throughout the whole ceremony, it will be the preferred language, although English has started to creep in. Um, we would expect elders um, to, be, to lead the ceremony, so they are respected elders of the family and of the Māori community, and everyone would have a role. So the family members would have a role, um, they would have roles such as a speaker, um, ritual chanters of our, of our traditional chants, um, and also people would have a role of offering hospitality to, the, to those that have come afar. So within this community funeral, um, you would have traditional values as part of the everyday part of the ceremony. Um, it will be enriched with our proverbs, um, our spirituality, um, historical family relationships, and connection to the land. So it's quite a deep and involved ceremony 
um, that every Māori person would want to have when they pass away. It is um, a community acknowledgement of the life that you led, but also a community acknowledgement of, the, of your next stage in life or going on to the afterworld. Um, next, next slide, please. Number six. So, one of the things I do want to acknowledge is that in 2009, we repatriated from two museums in Yotibori, um, Gothenburg, um, both the museum that you're sitting at and also the Natural History Museum. And so, I think about five. Um, Māori ancestral remains came, were repatriated from those two museums and um, a ceremony was part of the, the handover. So it was a combination of our ceremonies that we would um, do in New Zealand. We actually negotiated um, with those two particular museums um, to have our ceremony as part of the process of the handover ceremony. And so that's where speeches were made, three important speeches. Um, where the, the directors of the museum, uh, museums in Sweden acknowledged that um, the taking, the pillaging, um, the theft of our ancestors was part of the colonial period and they needed to be restored back to their homeland. And so that was in 2009, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And so oh, since 2003, we've done those ceremonies all, all around the world and we've returned 420 of our ancestors home undertaking that process. Um, could I have um, slide number seven, please? What I do want to take you through is, over the next few slides is the process of actually, once the ancestors come home to New Zealand, um, how we take them back to their communities of origin. So in, 2000, um, in 2014, um, September 2014, we returned about 14 Māori ancestral remains back to their community origin um, of a place called Waimarama. If you can look at the photo, you see that it's, um, it's a community by the sea. A lot of our ancestors came from very beautiful um, places in our country, um, places by the coast, um, and they were taken from caves associated with those coastal areas. Um, can I have slide, um, slide number eight, please? And so what you will see is uh, a number of um, people carrying um, next to a van and carrying the ancestral remains in their crates or their travelling cases onto the marae. And so the marae is the community centre. And so what this particular community did, they sent out their representatives to the van so that they will carry their own ancestors onto the marae, the community centre. Next slide, please. Slide number nine. And so... This particular marae, so you see a, a house standing there, that's called a whare nui or a whare tupuna, and it's called an ancestral house. And so the ancestral remains were taken um, into the, um, what we call the atamira, or the raised platform, and that's the porch area of the, of the house. And that particular um, house represents an ancestor. And so the, the, these particular ancestral remains are welcomed by the ancestor of the district and embraced by that ancestor uh, in the representation of the house. Um, and so the acknowledgement speeches are, being, are taking place as the ancestors um, are placed on the, the raised platform in the house. Um, if you go to slide number 10, so they've been acknowledged by the community of origin and now they've been carried back to, um, back to the van and they've been take, be taken to the burial site in the community. <coughs> and slide number 11 is where you have, um, we would say, um, uh, a grandmother and her children, um, her grandchildren, and these are community members who are willing, um, the ancestors that were taken over 100 years ago. And so they're being taken to the cemetery and the important thing about our community is why we have um, community participation is so that the, the act of the community memory um, is, is taking place as the, as the event occurs. Um, because the, the grandchildren and the grandmother will be there. The grandchildren over time will ask the grandmother, you know, more details about who the ancestors were, why did they come home, and why they were buried in that particular location. 
And so that's how the story continues within a community. And that's why a ritual is so an important part of our community. Um, in particular, um, the return of the ancestors. And my last slide, oh, the second to last slide is number 12. And so there's physical evidence of the um, ancestors actually being buried in, in, in that location. And with all um, Māori community events, um, one of the important things you will see in slide number 13 is that we eat. We eat um, for two different reasons. Eating is our process of um, spiritually cleansing ourselves. Um, the eating process make, brings us back to earth, brings us back into the everyday world. And so what you would notice on the table within this, um, this community lunch is seafood from the local coastal area, so it's delicacies and foods of the, of the local people. And so they wish to share their delicacies with us as their, um, their guests. And so I'm going to hand it over to um, Dr. Juden Jones now to carry on. Thank you. So um, the next slide is just a photograph of our university. We're in Birmingham, which is right in the middle of England very landlocked. And the next slide, please, is our medical school. And um, this is where I work. I teach medical ethics to the medical students, so how to behave. And I also look after our ancient human remains. So we have a collection of about 60 um, skeletal remains from all around the world. And the next slide, please, is about our Maori collection. We had five Māori ancestors, four skulls and one preserved head, Tuimoko. So it's a, a preserved mummified head of a Māori warrior, Māori chief, fully tattooed with his hair. And we take the unusual decision to be proactive about our repatriation. We don't wait for people to contact us to ask for their ancestors back we actually reach out. So the next slide, please, is about our decision. How, why do we actually decide to repatriate? Um, we recognise that in England we had an empire and it, as a colonial empire, it treated indigenous people in a very negative way often. It did a great deal of good, but it also did a great deal of harm. Um, one of the practices that we're really ashamed of is taking human remains, often from burial sites, often stolen, certainly never with consent. So nobody ever gave consent for their ancestors to be taken from their homeland and brought back to England. And we want to address our colonial history by um, we can't change the past, we can't ever undo what actually happened back in the 1800s, but we can live today as people who hold modern moral values, who want to treat people well, we want to value Indigenous people and their belief systems. So. That we see ourselves only as custodians, only as somebody who is looking after the ancestors, not as somebody who owns them. Some museums in Britain will see that they own these ancestors and won't give them back, but we take the opposite view. We see that we don't own them at all. We're just looking after them. So um, the next slide please is a photograph of how we decided to honour the ancestors. You can see that there's um, the ancestors are on the table under the Maori cloaks and then there's the five Maori Maori people from the delegation from Tapapa stood on the left and in collaboration with Tapapa we decided to hold a completely Maori orientated ceremony so we gave complete responsibility for that ceremony to Te Papa um, and to Te Hirikiki. So we didn't try and um, influence how the ceremony would happen. We allowed it to be done completely with Maori custom and practice. So the next slide, please. The most um, 
difficult decision for us was where to hold this ceremony because we're a very big university. We've got 38,000 staff and students. So it's busy, it's very secular. And so this room that you can see that the ceremony was in is called the Senate Chamber. It's the decision-making chamber for the university. It's where all the leaders of the university sit to make decisions. And we felt that that was the most appropriate venue. It's very private, but it's also um, a venue that's got huge prestige for the university as well. It's all about governance. The next slide, please, is um, again with Tapapa, this decision that we made to invite guests. Where, um, in, when the ceremonies happen in New Zealand, it's an open <coughs> ceremony, so just anybody can come. But we don't really have that in the UK. There's no tradition of just having a ceremony that anybody who isn't invited can come to. So that's the list of people that we decided to invite, senior university people, the New Zealand High Commissioner in London, the chaplaincy, so the different um, members of the clergy in the university, the Birmingham Museum and Art Galleries, who we're partners with, we had their people along, and community leaders, as well as staff and students. The next slide, please. Because we wanted to acknowledge that the practice of retaining ancestors and collecting ancestors was something that we felt was morally wrong. We also decided in collaboration with Tapapa to invite the media to the ceremony. And so we had um, both British and New Zealand media at the ceremony. And we also filmed the ceremony as well, and it's on YouTube. So the next and final slide, please is um, if you'd like to watch the ceremony and see what uh, a Maori ceremony is like in the UK, then or in any other institution that decides to hold a ceremony throughout the world, then you can watch it. It's 33 minutes long, and you'll see the ancestors being brought into the room, the prayers and the speeches that are made to the ancestors, the speeches that are delivered between the two institutions, uh, the gifts that are exchanged and the songs that are sung to the ancestors as well. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll open up to questions now. Uh, if you wish. Thank you for an incredibly clear presentation. Does anybody have any questions or comments or observations that need Stefan? <coughs> Speak like this, or? What will happen is that you, you speak, I will repeat it so that um, um, everybody can hear. Yeah, well, thanks for a very nice and interesting presentation. Uh, the thing I was wondering about is when you have these, um, uh, when you have these heads, which you mentioned were a kind of trophy heads taken from enemies and which were supposed to be despised, etc. Uh, what do you do with them upon return? Do you sort of return them to the victors or the enemies, so to speak? Well, what happens? Um, okay, going back to 1769 when the heads were taken, um, so that's over 200 years ago, and um, our culture has subsequently quite changed since that time, and also um, there's been a lot of inter tribal intermarriages since then. And so I'm a product of about eight different tribal groups. And so by me participating in, in the repatriation process, um, those heads belong as much to me um, now, and I'm just a reflection of the Māori community today, is that those ancestors belong to all of us now. And so at the moment, until we find exactly where they come from in the country, they'll be placed in the Wahi Tapu, the sacred repository within Te Papa. Thanks. I'm just going to pass the microphone to you. Hello, um, my name is Michelle. And I was wondering a little bit, how does the process work when you approach an institution um, that has remains that you would like returned? On what level in society does it happen? Is it 
institution to institution or higher up. <clears throat> and also, what happens, what do you do when you get a, a no answer? Is there anything more that you can appeal that decision in any way? Okay, um, part of the process of the establishment of our program in New Zealand, um, quite a number of Māori leaders right from the 1970s were seeking the return of our ancestral remains from um, institutions in Australia, North America and Europe. Um, with the leadership of those, those, those people, um, our program was established, but it has certain guidelines. We can only seek the repatriation by mutual agreement. So both um, institutions have to agree, or well, the institutions overseas have to agree. We're actually resourced by the New Zealand government. Um, and if, a if an institution says no, we actually think, in our heads we say, that's a yes just about to happen. Um, so we're in here for, we're here for um, the long term. Um, we want our ancestors to come home. They will always have a connection back to their country of origin. Um, their spiritual um, tie to our country um, is not severed. It's just waiting to come back. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Michelle? Yes, sir. Okay. Does have a question or an observation? Can I ask something? Um, I'm curious about what takes place in in the case that you gave, June, where the the ceremony takes place at Birmingham, and then there is another ceremony takes place on a Maori land um, after their ancestors are physically repatriated. What is the meaningfulness or lack of meaning that takes place in the act of transportation? Um, from one uh, geographic region to another geographic region, and how are the ethics and morals of that process conducted? So in the interstitial space between the um, site from which it's been repatriated and to the site of repatriation. So I think for me, the ethics of it is around um, Doing something that the ancestors would have wanted. If if we, if you know, if I come to Sweden now, I get on a plane and I have my passport and I buy my ticket, and I'm coming voluntarily. And um, the ancestors never came voluntarily. They were brought um, in a way that they wouldn't have wanted. And so I think for me, ethically, it's about doing what they would have wanted. It's about returning them to their own place. Um, and I think that we want to do a ceremony before they leave to prepare them and to prepare the people who've come to get them and to prepare people back at home as well so that the Maori communities that the ancestors are returning to know that all the preparations were done properly for them and that the they were covered spiritually for their journey. And then I'll let Tehirikiki talk about the importance of the ceremony when they come back home. Yes, so um, when we go to institutions overseas to collect our ancestors, to uplift our ancestors, um, we have a small delegation um, from New Zealand that, that does this. Um, this comprises of our elders and our, our spiritual leaders, both male and female. And um, part of the process of wanting to go to museums to uplift our ancestors is actually to um, to acknowledge that the ancestors were there for quite a long period. To actually acknowledge um, the care that was that they were under while they were in the institutions overseas. And so that requires a number of acknowledgement speeches um, on our behalf. We also want to um, prepare the, the ancestors to come home as well. And so we like to do that according to our rituals, to our practices. And um, we also do a presentation um, as part of the process as well. So before we did the handover ceremony, we actually did a presentation at Birmingham University, um, very similar to what we're doing now, um, so that we can inform the community um, why this is important and why it needs to happen. And so we're not just coming in in the dark, and taking our ancestors without anybody knowing. What we're doing is going in, 
talking about why it's important, informing the um, Birmingham University, informing the students, invo informing the, the senior people why this is such an important issue and why we need to treat our ancestors res with respect and, and honour. And so it's not a matter of just um, allowing our ancestors to be posted back to us because it's more important than that. We have to recognise um, the dignity of the ancestors and by actually going over and uplifting them and from heart to heart bringing them home, we think we are doing the right thing. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Gerald McMaster, we'll get a microphone for you, Gerald. Thanks, Kanchan. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening, uh, Tay and June. Uh, my name is Gerald McMaster. Uh, I'm a, a contemporary art curator. Uh, a few years ago, I saw the work of uh, one of your uh, artists by the name of Fiona Partington photographer and uh, her project was to photograph the, uh, the likenesses of uh, live masks which were found in the Quai Branly Museum in Paris. These live masks, uh, they appeared to be dead uh, figures but they're uh, taken from uh, living uh, Maori and, um, and so the, they're, they're, uh, the heads that were in uh, the museum in Cape Ron Lee. So she took these magnificently beautiful, large photographs of these live masks. Uh, the, as I understand it, the exhibition of her work toured throughout New Zealand and attracted a lot of attention. And you were uh, talking about the dignity of the, your people. And I'm wondering uh, to what extent uh, was that uh, the reception of that exhibition and this idea of almost returning, uh, but yet to some extent, you know, the likenesses are, are, are still live in this museum. You know, and I, it's a, a kind of a, an interesting conundrum of a live mask and then um, the ancestors. The, there's a kind of a disconnect. And I'm, I'm wondering if you're familiar with the project first of all, and how, and if you are, how did the Maori address this particular? exhibition and that toured throughout New Zealand. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with um, the project. I don't know Fiona myself, but I do, um, I'm familiar with her work. And um, what I do understand is um, from, from her perspective, um, those life masks, um, uh, uh, she belongs to the, the tribal group that those, those ancestors belong to. So in that situation, um, it's left up to that particular tribe um, to work through the issues um, related to, um, I suppose, the betrayal of those ancestors and how they may be um, incorporated into artworks that, that travel the world. Um, in respect to the mummified heads, and so the mummified heads are quite different. Uh, particularly the ones that were in Europe, because they they are the, the heads of people that died in war, that died in battle. And also they chose not to go overseas. And so it's quite a different situation. And that's why we actually don't, we prefer, if the, it's a mummified head, we would say a tuimoko, we do not want the images to be portrayed in the media. Um, it would be like having a soldier in World War I, um, a decapitated head or a soldier in World War II having their head um, in the media um, or an image. Um, but in respect back to Fiona's project, um, those are heads, as you said, of living individuals, living chiefs that chose to have their, their head as part of a, an art display or um, a life mask. So for us, it's quite two different situations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we need to move on now, but I, I'd like to thank both of our presenters for their presentation. Um, are you guys going to stay online for the remaining presentations or not? It's, of course, it's absolutely your choice. Um, it's, it's quite late here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we might go to bed. Right. 
Thank you so much. Um, I, I knew there was a significant time uh, difference, as Gerald also uh, acknowledged. So thank you so much for staying up late for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.